Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, I've got a Dell G5 laptop here. Really nice machine this actually. Uh, i7 GTX something. Whatever. Very nice laptop. Uh, it does not turn on. Um, so this has got the classic Dell symptom of uh, the charger cuts out. So I'll show you what this looks like. And if I plug the charger in, we go whack, and the light on the charger has gone out. And in order to make the charger light come back on again, I've got to unplug the charger. So disconnect it from the mains, wait a couple of seconds, plug it back in, and now the light has come back on. So as you can see, the charger is cutting out when we connect it to the laptop. So this is happening because there is a short circuit in the laptop. What we are likely to find is when we get into the laptop, there's probably a short circuit across the DC jack. Um, there might be a short circuit on vMain instead, but whatever. Let's open this up and look. So let's take the back cover off and see what we can get access to. So let's just peel back just so we can have a look at the wire colors. There we go. So as you can see, we've got a bunch of red pins, a bunch of black pins, and a white sense pin. So I want black the, ground, the black probe on the black pins, which are ground, and red probe to one of the red pins. And we've got no beep. Let's check the actual resistance. So let's go to resistance mode. So ohms. And we've got like 230 kilo ohms. So lots and lots of ohms. So there's no short on the DC jack. So that means we're completely fine here. This also means that it's not going to be a reverse protection diode or something like that, because the reverse protection diode would be across this DC jack. So if it was something super easy, like a bum diode, then we would be seeing a short circuit there. Uh, the bad news is it probably means that um, we've got a short on the main power rail, and that could be a much bigger problem for a big gaming laptop like this. Uh, either way, to get any further, I think we're going to have to actually disassemble the laptop. Let's have a look down here. And if you look super closely, hopefully it hasn't been mangled by compression, there's loads of tiny dots here. So those are vias, so that's where the path is going through the circuit board. And there's lots of those. So if we look on the other side of the board, we should see where those are coming out. And hopefully we'll see where we're getting lost. So on the other side of the board, we've got this big black square of plastic covering some stuff. Let's just peel that back. Okay. Well, there's our inrush limiter. This is what I was looking for. All right, so we need to do some back. Uh, we need to do some back and front comparisons. So these vias are going through to the other side of the board, and they're connecting to places. So we need to see how this is all linking up, so we know where the power is coming from and where it's going to. So let's just do some comparisons. Right. So starting from here again, we've got these two groups of vias here, and oh, let me use a pointer that's useful. So starting from the top side of the board again, we've got this group of vias here and here, which correspond on the other side of the board to here and here. So this is our DC in connection here, and it's going through these tiny little inductors on both sides of the boards. So they're getting smoothed out by those, and then they're going into these two MOSFETs. This is our inrush limiter. This is what I was looking for. If we put our black probe onto a ground point, so I'm going to put go onto this screw hole down here. Um, so once again, our DC jack, not shorted. The input to the inrush limiter, not shorted. So now between the MOSFETs over here, not shorted. 
And then so we go in here and then into this one, then out of here and we're coming across underneath to here. And there's our short circuit. So this is the main current sense resistor. So this forms a bridge onto the main power rail in the laptop, which is this big trace coming all the way up through here and going off up here, going off the places in the laptop. Notice there's another group of vias here. So this big trace continues on the other side of the board to go to places as well. So that current sense resistor, this is our main entry point into the laptop and this is where we can detect our short from. And if we look at any other point on this power rail, so let's go all the way up to, let's go all the way up to here. So here's something else on that. Again, black probe on a screw hole, that's shorted. Those are shorted. Anything else on here will be shorted to ground. That's shorted. Back of these caps, shorted, all shorted. Everything on the main power rail is shorted. So we need to figure out why. Now, firstly, we need to check for a trap. I'm in continuity mode at the moment. So I'm in beep mode. So my multimeter just beeps on low resistance. Now, what I want to check is, do we have a dead short circuit or do we have low resistance? All right, there we go. So we've got 0.6 ohms. That's great. That's less than one ohm. Less than one ohm to all intent and purpose is a dead short circuit. What I'm checking for is if we'd had, say, three ohms or something like that, three ohms is not a dead short. That's low resistance. Now, the big ICs on the board, like the CPU and the GPU, uh, not necessarily in that order. No, that's the CPU, that's the GPU, yeah. Um, these will have a very, very low internal resistance. And if one of the MOSFETs feeding power into them had gone dead short circuit, the short circuit that we'd see is from ground, through the chip, through the shorted MOSFET, and onto the main power rail. Now, what that means is that the short circuit is through the chip. And that is bad. We don't want to inject power there because we might kill that chip. Although if it's shorted already, it might already be dead. So we want to make sure that we've, ch we've checked for short low resistance and we've not seen any low resistance. So at this point, although we'll check again, we can reasonably believe that our CPU and our GPU are probably okay. However, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove the um, uh, the heatsink and we're going to do a physical inspection of the board to see if we can see any craters or anything that's gone bang. Right, now let's have a close-up down here because if anything has gone bang it'll be around here somewhere because this is all the high power stuff. These are the VRMs, the voltage regulator modules. So what we have here are these are power stages. This is These are on semiconductor power stages and they are um, a set of MOSFETs forming a buck regulator and the drivers for those MOSFETs all in a single chip. So this is the kind of setup that you'll see on a high-end uh, buck regulator. So we've got our power stages, inductor, capacitors, CPU, and then supplying these, um, we've got another bunch of small surface mount capacitors and resistors doing various things. So we want to check if any of those guys have gone nuclear. So we're looking for any of them that look darkened or missing or anything like that. And it all looks pretty good around there. Without doing a full systematic sweep of the board, this looks fine. I don't think we're going to see any visible damage. So I'm going to carry on. Good. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to check if we've got any short circuits through any of these, MOS, any of these power stages. So let's go... Let's zoom out slightly. Now, by virtue of the fact that we've got half an ohm of resistance to ground, um, I'm already confident that there's nothing wrong with any of these. But we can check again anyway. So if I go, if I put my black probe onto the main power rail, and the main power rail is probably going to be on this capacitor here. Right, we'll check if that is on the main power rail, because if it's at half an ohm to ground, then we know that's the main power rail. Uh, 0.9, can we get better probing on that? Yeah, well, it's still below an ohm, that's probably good enough. 
So if we use this as our reference point, so we'll go black probe on that capacitor, and I'm going to check to the inductor, which is on the other side of the power stage. And as you can see, there's three and a half ohms. So that is not resistance through the power stage. The power stage is at high resistance. What we're seeing there is we're going, we've got a short to ground here. We're going into ground all the way through the ground plane, back through the CPU, back through the inductor to here. And the three and a half ohms we're seeing is through the CPU. So that's not shorted because we're going all the way back through ground through our short circuit to get there. So that is all good. If we saw zero ohms there, that would imply that we've got zero ohms going through that power stage. And that means that our CPU is probably dead, or rather this power stage has gone short circuit. This guy here, you'll notice he's separate. He's got a slightly smaller inductor on him, and you can see a separation there. This is probably system agent, which is the second biggest power rail going into the CPU. So we'll check the system agent as well. So once again, I'm going to go on my, my trusty shorted capacitor. And let's go to that inductor there. And we've got 20 ohms there. So again, this guy is also fine. So system agent, not shorted. No problem. Good. Right, let's give the same treatment to GPU vCore. So once again, we're going to go from our shorted capacitor to one of these guys, doesn't matter which one, again, they'll all be common. And we've got one ohm. So this is very low, however, GPUs are super low. But the important thing is, our main short circuit is less than an ohm. Like we were at 0.6 at the, at the um, current sense resistor. What this means is that at this point, I can be reasonably assured that I'm clear to do voltage injection. We know that if we do voltage injection, we're not going to immediately sync that power into the CPU or the GPU, which is what would concern me. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to voltage injection. We're going to hook up jumper wires. So let's get rigged up for jumper wires. People have asked me before, why can't you just inject from the charger? Well, we can't inject on the charger because the inrush limiter keeps turning off because the power management chip is detecting a short. So we can't inject with the charger. So we have to put something in behind the inrush limiter. So the, so the board cannot turn off that power. Uh, so that is why we're going to inject into the middle of the circuit board. The current sense resistor is a great place to go to because we know that that's behind the inrush limiter. And it's also a nice big resistor that we can solder wires to. So I'm going to hook up jumper wires to that and then we'll set up our power supply. Now, when we start injecting power and something gets hot, we need to find out what is getting hot. And in the past, I've done this just with the touchy-feely method, as I call it, where I just use the tips of my fingers to find the hot spot. However, this time around, I finally got myself a thermal camera. So this is a FLIR 1 thermal camera, and this is a phone attachment. So Type-C plugs into the bottom of your phone, and you can use the app on a phone to view the thermal camera. All right. So this is going to be kind of janky to show you guys with a camera looking at a camera looking at a board. But as you can see, we now have actual real thermal imaging. And when uh, when I move my hand away, we're getting a very ambient thing. And when something hot comes into view, like my hand, which is at about 31 degrees, then we get a big old hot spot. Right, power on. 1 volt and 3 amps. Now you'll notice that we're already up to 0.9 of a volt, and that's because we were only just under an ohm of resistance, which is a little bit on the high side, so that concerns me slightly. However, we are still putting in 2.7 watts of power, so I think we may still work. So let's see if anything is showing up yet. Okay, well, looking at the rest of the board here, you can see that it's pretty mediocre. If I put my hand into view there as a reference, the board is cold. But over there, something is heating up, something's flaring. It's not particularly warm 
to my finger touch. So if that's actually it, then man, this thermal camera works like a charm if that's actually it. I'm just going to turn the board over and see if there's anything hot on the other side. There's another capacitor there, so that might be it as well. Yeah, I think that boy's hot. It's really hard to tell. It would have taken me a long time to find that with the touchy-feely method. But with the thermal camera, that just lit up like a Christmas tree. I couldn't have hoped for a better example. I like to... Th I feel like there's some heat there, but... Oh, yeah, just about. It's really subtle, though. If I pump 4 amps into that, it might go nuclear. However, I feel like we've found it and we've managed to find it at a relatively low power level as well. So let's take both those capacitors off and see which one of them is shorted. And with a bit of luck, we may have been able to find this without having to dump 4 amps into the board, which is very cool. Power supply off. So I'll put black probe on ground. So one side of this... This side is going to be ground anyway, because capacitors 9 times out of 10 go to ground. 1.2 ohms. Hmm. Okay, and the other side? 1.2 ohms. Fine. Well, it's certainly shorted. So again, if I touch both sides of that, we get 1 ohm. So what about the capacitor on the other side? Is that going to tell us any different? Yeah, same deal. Again, there's our 1-ish ohm short. Fine. So, because these are in circuit, we can't tell which one it is because both of them have got ground on both sides because the power rail is shorted to ground. So we need to take these off of the board to actually determine which one has failed. Because we're very close to uh, back plates and heat sinks and stuff, I'm just going to wet both sides of these capacitors with some fresh solder, which will lower the melting point of the solder and make them easier to remove. Some hot tweezers would be lovely right now, but I don't have hot tweezers. I do have hot air though. Huh. We have a shorted capacitor at half an ohm. That guy's dead. So what about this one? And that one, as you can see, we have kilo ohms and rising. So it's absorbing power and the resistance is building up as it absorbs power. So that one is behaving as you would expect. And this one is dead short circuit. That's our dead capacitor. So... What we should now find, let's put the dead one there and the live one over there because we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Meanwhile, back on the motherboard, if I check between ground and the current sense resistor and we are no longer shorted to ground, we've got 100,000 ohms and rising. So on the board here, we had a 10 microfarad on one side, but the dead one from the other side it could well be a 100 microfarad, or it might be, you know, a, a 1 picofarad, a 10 picofarad, or something like that. Even though it's the same size, it might not be identical. So just to be safe, I'm going to track down a schematic for this board. And here it is. So what we're going to do now is find the circuit that these capacitors are from. Now, if we look at the board here, it says here PU18V00. So PU18 is that little chip there, which is what this capacitor is on. So if we find that on the schematic, we're going to find those capacitors nearby. So let's go to PU18 V00 and see what we can find. Right, and here we are. I should open this in uh, uh, Adobe Reader, to be honest. It's a bit easier to find stuff. So these two capacitors here, these are going to be our guys. These are the ones that we're looking at. So let's zoom in on those. And they are 25 volt capacitors. They're both 0805, which is the size. And they're both 10U, which will be 10 microfarads, because the micro symbol is like a U. So you'll often see UF. It's actually micro. So they're both 10 microfarad capacitors. 
So we actually could have taken a guess that because one of them was a 10 mic, the other also would be a 10 mic. But it was worth checking anyway. But this kind of goes to show that more often than not, if you take a guess, you can probably get lucky most of the time. But I'm not going to say that I recommend that. Finding a schematic and getting the actual measurement is always better if you can. In any case, I need a 10 microfarad capacitor. So let me go to my capacitary. Here we go, 106. That didn't take long. As you can see, I've used a couple of these ones already. That's a giveaway as to which one was the correct option. So now we're going to hot air our new capacitor and the other one that was still working onto the board. So I've brought my airflow right down now so we don't blow these away. Now, oh, I'm going to put some uh, flux on the board as well. The flux makes sure that we get a nice good join and it's also handy because it helps locate things in place. It adds just a little bit of um, goop that stops you from blowing things away. So let's go into there. And I'm still blowing it away. There we go, that's that one done. Now the other side. Now I'll just use the soldering iron just to touch up both sides, just to tidy that up slightly. Just remove those blobby bits we've got on the end. And once again, with both of the capacitors back on the board, we'll just do another short check and we can verify that we still are not shorted ground. So you can see the multimeter cycled a couple of times where it went from low resistance to high resistance. And now we're sitting up in the mega ohms. So let's remove our jumper leads and we're basically going to reassemble the laptop now. Right, the back panel is still off, but we're together enough to do a test run. So, charger is here, the light is on, plug it in. And the light is still on. You can just see that on camera. And if I push the power button, sign of life light, caps lock LED is on, which is what modern Dells do. I think it turned off. Trying again. Come on. I'm just going to turn it on again and just give it a third attempt at a post. It did one power cycle there, so that was it did attempt one, attempt two, here's attempt three. Turned off. It turned off. Okay. Attempt four. There it goes. God, that went kicking and screaming. Time and day not set. Please run setup program. My dude, that's fine with me. We are WinRAR. Right, let's turn that off. Right, very good example on why you sometimes should give it several tries before you say, no, that's not working. Because, like... I don't know how to explain it. Like, sometimes when you're looking at something, you're like, that's dead, it's not going to post. But there are other times where I'm just like, no, this thing is ready to go. This thing wants to start. It just needs to try a couple of times. So I've sometimes referred to things as RAM training. 
uh, which means it is detecting what RAM is installed and what speeds it can run at. And I have suspicion that that was RAM training messing us about there. So let's put this back, uh, this back piece back on. So the battle is fought and the war is won. Um, that one was a bit of a journey um, because I went into a lot of detail. So I'm hoping that was appreciated and uh, helpful to people. But I feel like we got some really good demonstrations out in that one. So uh, this is all fixed now. We had a shorted capacitor on uh, one of the secondary power rails. In this case, a 1.35 volt uh, power rail. Uh, we found it, we replaced it, and now the laptop is good to go. So thank you everyone for watching. Um, my support links for my um, Patreon, my Discord server, and also my Twitter and Instagram are down in the description below. And if you enjoy this video, don't forget to hit the like button because it tells YouTube that you like this content and it helps me out as well. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you very much and bye for now.